here's the James Spooner behind me. Um, it's uh, it's been a part for a load of work to paint behind the tanks to complete the piping that goes runs behind the tanks, and it's uh, now been reassembled with that painting work done. So the tanks and the cab shouldn't have to come off again. The uh, the front sheets of the cabs cab has been painted as you can see um, the final livery and lined um, because we, we wanted to do that uh, before we do any um, assembly of pipework outside the cab um, and the painters couldn't couldn't paint that area once it's uh, it's all assembled so Although it doesn't look that much different than when you last saw it, it's uh, quite a lot of work has gone on um, and is still going on. Um, finishing off the paint, the uh, the pipe work um, in the cab and in the uh, bottom end smoke box at the moment. Um, Bob's doing the ejector exhaust. Lots of details like that are being worked on at the moment. The injector on the the driver's side injector is in the, in the cab behind and then the delivery comes up and into the, the clack valve, that non-return valve there and then it's delivered into the boiler in the top. It's delivered in the top so that the steam and water go into the steam space and any oxygen that's dissolved in the feed water flashes off into steam straight away, hopefully, rather than if it was injected under the water level, then it would be more likely to be dissolved in the water. And we have trouble with boiler corrosion, so um, a top feed is a, a good idea, hopefully, to help the boiler last longer. So these are the main steam pipes that go in the smoke box. Um, there's a braided stainless steel hose bit that allows for a bit of movement on the superheater header and the smoke box so it can adapt slightly to any any movements due to heat um, and it's got this stainless steel shroud added here that stops the ash coming from the fire battering the the hose so this is the smoke box of the James Spooner. It's all stainless steel, so it lasts for a long time. This is the spark arrester. This is the mesh that all the, the hot gases from the fire have to pass through before going up the chimney. So hot gases come from down here. They hit a solid baffle at the back, down under this table plate, and then up through the mesh, which stops any big burning bits getting sucked out of the chimney um, and then the, the blast pipe is in there and it basically blows all the bits out of the chimney. This is called the dark bar, uh, basically um, a hooked part goes in here and you turn it and it locks the door shut and the door seals against this lip. Um, which sticks into a rope seal so that it makes a good seal because any air leaking in here is a bad thing because it um, reduces the vacuum that's pulling on the fire so that means less good steaming and also if there's a lot of hot char in here air getting in can cause it to actually start burning inside the smoke box which is another bad thing for fire risk um, and also it damages the smoke box so we want stuff to be in here hot but, but not actually burning so no oxygen getting in here is, is good. Like on the David Lloyd George we've uh, added this coal bunker extension called a greedy board so that we can carry more coal because the coal we're burning at the moment uh, is not Welsh coal, sadly. Um, it's uh, inferior imported coal and it's, uh, we, we burn more of it. 
So we had a couple of instances of the David Lloyd George running out of coal. So uh, anyway, we've um, preempted it on this by making the greedy boards ready. So the middle section of the roof is removable in two pieces. Um, it's made of aluminium, so it's easily removed and replaced. And it's held in place by these catches. So you see you can undo the catch and then the driver well, the fireman can take this side off, the driver can take the other side off. Um, obviously these have yet to be finished and painted, but uh, they, will be, they will be painted. And uh, there's a gutter in here that runs down and into there, so that the rain will be deflected off the cab side hopefully not dripping onto the crew. Here's the other end smoke box, uh, which hasn't got the sparker arrestor in at the moment. You can see the blast pipe tip here, pointing up the chimney. Um, this thing down here contains the, the pipe that uh, is articulating on the bogey underneath so that the pipe can move across and it's pivoted in a, a ball joint in the top here. So there's a ball joint there, and then the, say the exhaust is directed straight up the chimney. You can see the superheater elements, and the, uh, the flanges where the spark arrestor will be mounted. Again, all this is now made of stainless steel so that um, it won't rot. This is the bottom end power bogey to go under James Spooner. Uh, it's had a, an overhaul ready to, to go in. Um, the valve gear and all the motion, the wheels and everything have all been stripped out. Um, the frames have been painted. Uh, inside red, outside black. The wheels have been painted. Everything's been cleaned. Um, the valve gear has been... Uh, rebushed to our current standards so it's all good to go um, you can see here the uh, exhaust pipe that i was just talking about um, inside the james spooner's um, smoke box so there's the bottom ball there's an equivalent item that sits on the top with a a top ball and it can slide up and down here so that allows the bogey to pitch up and down and it can move and then it can articulate any way any way it wants so this bottom ball is now sealed by ptfe rings the top ball being in a very hot location the ptfe would melt so it's sealed by a a bronze ring at the top. This bogey is a bit of a, a hybrid. Um, the wheel centres date from the 1870s. They were um, made for the Berlin Emirates originally. Um, but the frames and the cylinders and the rest of it was uh, mainly built in the 1980s for the reconstruction of, of Merlin Emrys. Um, uh, but say, the, some of the valve gear parts are newer, um, and it's been, say, overhauled many times. Um, but say, this bogey now is gonna go under, under the James Spooner. Here we've got the second power bogey for James Spooner, the, the top end. Um, it's, as you can see, it's been stripped down, ready for cleaning. Um, it'll have a good clean and then it'll be uh, 
paint will be rubbed down and it'll be re repainted like the uh, like the bogey you saw. Um, we're not doing a major overhaul because uh, it's not done that many miles since it was last overhauled. But because it's going under a new loco, it's going to be cleaned and painted, and checked, and uh, say the valve gear details sorted out so that it's up to the current standard. Um, so it should go under and do several years in traffic uh, before the bogey needs to come out again for a, a, another overhaul. So here's a bell and a whistle for the James Spooner. Um, the uh, the bells have been uh, donated by um, some contributors that uh, have paid for paid for them to be cast. Um, very nice they are with the the number and the name of the loco in. Um, the uh, this, this is in here at the moment to have a wooden um, decorative shape added. Um, and so here's a, there's a drawing for the, um, for the design of the wooden cladding to be made. Right. This. This is Kirstjewit 4415, the second diesel locomotive, I'm reluctant to say, to be built in the UK, but the first diesel locomotive to run properly in the UK. Um, built as a demonstrator, it ran on the Welsh Island Railway in 1927 for six months and on the FR in 1928 for six months. First diesel locomotive to haul a passenger train in the United Kingdom. Uh, and then spent most of its life in Mauritius on a sugar plantation. Came back to the UK a long time ago and used to live in a shed at Minford, sort of unloved, but quite cared for in that we all knew that it was important. We needed to do something about it. And it's now in the middle of an extremely protracted volunteer run overhaul, which has got a big conservation focus so we are trying to make it as close to it was in the condition it ran the thrice weekly Dinas to Beth Gallup passenger service in February 1928 which is a really specific date and there's no photographs of it so you can't say we've got it wrong. 4415 seems to have a bit of a cult following in the uh, in the modeling world um, and I'm assuming that stems back to the 1970s when David Brewer produced a little white metal kit of it. Um, and interestingly, David Brewer uh, and some other 009 people, including David Gander, were part of a or group called the Greenwich and Narrig District Narragage Railway Society, who aren't a Narragage Railway Society, they're a group of modelers. But they, um, they were aware that the locomotive was still in existence in, in Mauritius. Um, and somehow they came across a French guy called Olivier Joubert, uh, who was a railway enthusiast with contacts out there. And, uh, and, through, uh, and through Olivier Joubert, they, uh, they were able to arrange the repatriation, although the repatriation was funded by the um, Fist and Young Railway Trust. Uh, interestingly, Joubert always says you'd never have got it out without a Frenchman because uh, the French, French, it was a, Mauritius was a British colony, but previously it'd been a French colony. They hate the British. If you want to know more, you need the merchandise. 15 shillings changed. Not my merchandise, Kerr Stewart's merchandise. And in here, they tell you why the diesel locomotive is so wonderful and why it's going to change your life. It's a fascinating read. It's a combination of hype, written in the finest 1920s style, with some strange truths in it, like that diesel will usurp the petrol engine, which it did. Uh, and now we're getting to the end of the diesel era. It seems a, a little bit ironic. 
but it also um, it also all sorts of fascinating stuff like we haven't invented a starter motor that's powerful enough to power a diesel engine but we have the solution the solution's here and that's a petrol engine and then they say having slagged off the petrol engine that the petrol engine's the answer to everything so uh, that's a fascinating little thing uh, of course after years and years of neglect we didn't have a petrol engine but it's always amazing what you can get off ebay uh, so yeah ebay from spain purchase here uh, correct model absolutely bang on for the uh, for the for the locomotive in its as-built condition yeah if you read 15 shillings change available from dodgy retailers on the ebay um, it will describe the wonderful Kerr Stewart starting arrangement, um, which is all lies really, because the starting arrangement was actually designed and produced by McLarens. Um, but we'll put plus, they, they glossed over the details, so I don't see why should, we should be too hung up on it. Um, what we've got here is we've got the little Blackburn single cylinder petrol engine, um, and it has a chain drive from here to here. Um, if you, and there's a little gearbox here, if you configure this in the correct way, you can put a starting handle on there, which then drives that wheel to drive that wheel, which will then enable you to start the petrol engine. Once you've done that, you can reconfigure the gearbox so that the petrol engine's turning over, driving backwards through the chain in the sort of the opposite direction. Um, and then that's uh, then attached to the diesel engine and then, according to the book, um, it's great because petrol engine will run forever. And even if it takes 10 to 15 minutes to start, eventually it'll start. So uh, a little adventure for the future there. So uh, interesting uh, and, and very curious arrangement, really. Teak shutters. Teak's not a sustainable material these days. Fortunately, in the 70s, lots of people didn't make bookshelves out of teak. So uh, thanks to all our members. Um, Loads of teak hanging around in people's garages now, wonderfully repurposed. So uh, yeah, a proper wreck that we are trying to bring back ever so carefully to life. What's left to do is, uh, is almost everything because uh, despite the amazing appearance of it at the moment, in the next 12 to 14 months, we're gonna take it all apart and start again. Um, all the body at the moment we've spent all winter drilling about 900 to 1,000 holes in it um, and we bolted it all up. We need, now need to take it all apart, clean up the jointing faces, rivet it up, grip blast it and paint it properly. Not, uh, I know it looks proper, but it's not proper. Uh, and then we've got the engine, which, uh, yeah, so it returned with its 1945 re-engined engine. Uh, and we looked at it and declared it a knacker. Um, since then, we've managed to get hold of an engine which is even more knackered than that one. But that is a, a McLaren MDB4, um, which is the, loc the engine that the locomotive was built with. Um, we're spending a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a huge amount of research to get that local engine restored so that it is as it was. So, yeah. The fact that the injectors were missing, bit of a problem, but eventually we managed to track down the drawings for the injectors. So we've had uh, components for new injectors manufactured. We need to make new fuel pump. We need to make a new governor unit. We've made a new crankshaft, um, not personally, but we've spent a load of money on having a new crankshaft made. The uh, catastrophic damage that it suffered to the crankcase, we've had that repaired. We've put new cylinder liners in at the moment. Um, so it will be, yeah, as I said, restored to its February 1928 condition um, in as very every detail we're trying to get right. Even the, uh, even the vacuum exhauster, which we think will be absolutely useless because we can't believe the way it works will generate enough vacuum to get the train out of the platform. But we're going to put it back in and see what happens. It's got a load of, uh, it's got a load of unusual by more modern diesel standards. It's got some quite unusual features. One of the most obvious is the fact that it's got um, the world's biggest cab heater. Uh, and when it's got shutters on it for tropical use, that seems a bit odd. Why they put the radiator 
in this end um, and the gearbox at the other end. Who knows? Um, I think they soon realized their mistake because they made a larger variants of this um, and, uh, and within the three years of sort of prototype development, they shifted the radiator to the other end. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's an odd feature. Although you look at the radiator and think, well, that's odd. Nobody ever comments on the fact that the engine isn't on the center line of the locomotive. And I find that particularly odd. Hello, welcome to Glamour Puff. Uh, I'm Patrick. I'm in charge of the Mountaineer project, as you can see beside, behind me. Um, uh, we've been uh, quite busy of late, uh, but to give you an update on what we've been doing uh, since I last spoke to you, uh, we've um, been clear, clearing out the depot here. We've uh, rehomed and thrown away a large amount of material. Um, we've got rid of some machines. We've had a brand new roof, which is why it's slightly lighter in here, even though the electric lights are not working as of yet. Um, and we've uh, got the workshop to a nice place where we could bring the mountaineer in from the carriage shed. Uh, we started off by removing the oil firing equipment, such as the oil tanks or the control valves and the pipe work and the pan plate at the bottom of, of the firebox. Uh, for eventual display somewhere in Boston Lodge, hopefully, as a, a historic item. Uh, we then started removing all the cab fittings, like all the gauges and valves, and they've now been safely stored away, uh, ready for cleaning and uh, further restoration work to happen to them. Uh, we've also removed the large uh, pipe work, so all the water pipe work and any sort of vacuum exhausts that went across the top of the locomotive. Uh, and we've, the big bit, which you can see quite obviously, we've removed both the water tanks, uh, making the engine look quite uh, different to uh, how you'd normally see it. Uh, and we've also removed from inside the smoke box the blast pipe and the superheater elements and headers, which of one superheater we found uh, quite a big hole in it. So I think they'll be on the list of things to replace. Uh, when the time comes. Um, so, what, uh, so what we've got next, uh, we're going to remove, next working part, we're going to remove all the cladding, uh, reveal all the boiler external surfaces, um, so we can have a look at those, and we'll also unbolt the cab. Uh, we probably won't lift it off in this immediate time, because uh, we need a telehandle to do that, but we'll at least find out how it's attached. Uh, ready to do a one-shot sort of uh, removal of that and we'll take off the cladding uh, from around the cylinders as well so then uh, we have a good view of quite a lot of components and we can start to begin to make um, decisions on what we might be wanting to do with them we'll have to get into the realms of taking tubes out and the regulator uh, valve out the dome and then we'll have to we, we can then get the uh, boiler inspector in and start doing thickness tests on the plate material uh, and uh, any stays and we can formulate a plan with uh, Mr uh, John Wally on how we progress with the restoration after that um, if you wish to support us uh, we're always looking for support in many different ways uh, we have Monthly working parties, uh, please contact myself at pbooth.furwer.com uh, if you want to come and help. Uh, any skills you have uh, are more than welcome, uh, just as long as you're able to come to a workshop, you're more than welcome to come along. Tea and cake uh, may be provided at times. Uh, we also have a sales stand at events two to three times a year. Uh, we're always looking for people to come and man that because we sell some merchandise uh, to raise funds and it's an uh, opportunity to talk to the public and other interested people on the project at the time. Uh, as I said, we sell merchandise. We have our own website um, where you can buy merchandise, nice quality items that also give a little bit of money back uh, to the project and raise awareness. And it's a relatively fashionable even for... Uh, people like myself. 
And uh, if you wish to support us directly, please go to the Festiog Railway uh, Society page. They have a dedicated fund uh, for paying towards the Mountaineers. We're progressing quite well. We aim by the end of this year to have the, as I said, the boiler without its tubes and hopefully in the state where it can be in inspected and all the valve gear and the cylinders are apart with no pistons. So uh, it's exciting times really this year uh, leading into 2024. I think we might be able to update you more on any restoration decisions we come up with after that point. So thank you.